Well, good afternoon, folks. Uh, can I sit? Will you still see me? If I sit. Is that okay? Thank you. Um, welcome, uh, one and all. It's good to see so many of you here uh, this afternoon. And um, I presume you all know why you're here. So we're here. <laughs> uh, we're here to uh, uh, to meet with Dr. Steve Aster and to have a discussion based uh, around uh, a book which, uh, um, which Steve has recently published called The Invisible Church, which uh, in many ways, well, in fact, I won't tell you what the book's about. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll bring that out in the discussion, shall we? But it talks a lot about what church is and how church looks in the, um, in the 21st century. So Steve is a um, mission development worker. North? Yeah. I assume that means that there is a mission developed worker south. Uh, no. All oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> but there's one east and west. And All right. Okay. to the south. <laughs> okay. Uh, working for the, the the Church of Scotland. What does that What does that mission developer worker north do, Steve? Um, the main part of my job is working with congregations throughout the, the Highlands and Islands and. Uh, typically, I would work with a congregation over a, a few months, run a series of uh, workshops, retreats, conferences to help them reflect on uh, what it means to be church in their particular part of the world at this particular time. Excellent. Thank you. So what we're going to do, uh, what we're going to do this afternoon is, uh, just in a moment, Steve's going to uh, lead us all in a participatory fashion lead us all through a little exercise which will get us to think about uh, uh, some of the things that we're going to talk about this afternoon. And then I have some, uh, some questions for Steve about the book um, and uh, um, uh, he'll give us a short reading from the book and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll open the floor to questions from, uh, from your good selves. So that's the plan. Steve, can I hand over to you? Okay. Yeah. I'm afraid I'm one of these annoying people that when I see a group of people sitting down like this, I want to get them to stand up and make them do something. Uh, it's just the way I work. And you may have noticed when you came in that on your seat, there was a card. And your card will either have a number on it uh, or it will have a, a statement. And within the room, there are five different pairs of cards. So your card is paired up with at least one other person nearby you. So if it's a statement, somebody sitting just by you has a number that corresponds to it. If it's, uh, if it's a number, somebody's got a statement. Okay. So I'll just give you two or three minutes, but re read what now, you've got. Now, did you get all that? I appreciate we're just after lunch. <laughs> it's quite warm in here. <laughs> so there should be a statement and numbers that match. So ha have a look around. Um, talk to your neighbours, see what they've got, and see if you can pair up with another card. <laughs> Yes, just as the same. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Yes,
Okay. I, I have a I have a sixth sense for when people have started to talk about other stuff, <laughs> related stuff, and you've just crossed that line. Um, do you? Uh, does anybody here have a very large number on their card? Who's got a particularly large number? Okay, right. Uh, did any of you find somebody that had a statement that you think matches up with your very large number? Okay. So the number, uh, you have 178 million, and you're absolutely correct. What that is, is the estimated number of churchless Christians in the world, according to the World Christian Encyclopedia. What about a very small number? Has anybody got a number less than one? <laughs> yes, two-thirds, all right. And did any of you think you found somebody who had a statement which related to that two-thirds? Not very grammatical statement. <laughs> I was looking for the little word OF, which would make it more grammatical. Uh, two-thirds of Christians who used to attend church. Two-thirds Christians who used to attend church. Really? Church. Dear <laughs> me. Sound right. Well, I would sack my secretary if I had one, but I don't have so full responsibility for that. Uh, you're absolutely right. So what we found uh, through our research is that of those people who uh, used to be regular church attenders and now uh, are not regularly attending church, two-thirds of those people would say that their faith is still important to them, still central to their, to their lives. Uh, what about a percentage? Anybody got a percentage? There's a couple of different ones, I think. Okay, 15%. Uh, and uh, did you find anybody, Anne, that you think has a statement that relates to 15% perhaps? We were discussing uh, the number of people in the Highlands and Islands who identify themselves as Christians and not engaged with the church. Incorrect. Incorrect. <laughs> anybody else? Right. The proportions of Christians who are not engaged with the church and not engaged with the church. Yes, that is correct. So let me just explain that a little bit. So 15% is the number of uh, Christians who are not involved with the church congregation and they never have been, okay? So out of that group of people who identify themselves as Christians but not attending church, 15% of those people say that they never did. So these are people who have encountered uh, Christ outside of the context of a, of a congregation and have embraced the Christian faith in some way without any particular uh, substantial links to a church congregation. Uh, there was another percentage, I think, slightly larger, 22%. Ian, did you find anybody with a statement that might um, fit? The proportion of Christians who are not engaged... Oh, no, no. We've had that. Anybody think they've got 22 percent? <laughs> so those Christians who used to attend church and no longer do so, they say they left suddenly. Okay. Yes, that is a correct answer. So 22 percent. So of those people who uh, used to be church attenders, now they're not. 22 percent of those people say they left suddenly. Now, I think the most interesting thing about that statistic is that it means that the vast majority of people who used to be church attenders and now are not left gradually. So by far the majority of people say they left over a period of time. And the people we've interviewed often describe a period of months or even years when they're kind of on the way out, if you like. And I think that if, if you're... Um, part of a local congregation, as I am, I think that has some huge implications for us because it, it means that in all likelihood in our own congregations there are people who are on that kind of trajectory and it raises the challenge to us 
uh, how well do we understand the ups and downs of people's lives and particularly the, how people are experiencing the particular uh, congregational context that, that they're in. Now, there was, I think there's one that we haven't covered. Yes, there was another number, fairly large number. 132,000. Anybody think they've got that one? That yes, at last. Number, number of people in the Highlands and Islands who identify themselves as Christians and not engaged in a church. Okay, so 132,000. Those people who say, I'm a Christian, but I'm not involved with a local church. Now, I suspect that if you're anything like me, the first thing comes to your mind when you hear that is, but what do people mean by that? So when somebody says, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church, what do they mean? Do they mean they are uh, a follower of Jesus Christ and that, that faith is central to their lives and it touches every aspect of their life? Or at the kind of other end of the spectrum, if you like, are there people using that as a kind of cultural label? So, yeah, I was, I was born in Britain, it's a Christian country, so I'm Christian. Well, uh, in the research that we did, we carried out a survey with a large random sample, and within that survey, there was a, a block of ten questions that probed that issue. And the same ten questions have been used in other parts of the world, in other research projects, and it, it have been kind of validated, tested, if you like, as to their reliability. And what we found was that half of that number, um, so half of that 132,000 people in the Highlands and Islands, say, uh, indicated that they're high scorers on those questions. So these are people who, through their answers to those questions, indicated that they have a faith that is important to them and makes a difference to, to their lives. So that, that was just a little... Uh, icebreaker and to just introduce some of the issues behind the, the book that we're talking about this afternoon. Excellent, thank you Over Steve. Over to you James. Uh, I just realised that I uh, omitted two uh, housekeeping issues uh, as we started. Firstly, if you've not signed in, could you please sign in? That's for fire regulation, so that we know to come looking for you if there is a fire. Hopefully you have all signed in on the way here, but if not, please do so. And I didn't introduce myself, that's partly because I know most of you, but uh, my name's Andrew Steve, uh, my name's Jamie Grant, um, I'm uh, Vice Principal Academic um, here at the College. And I should explain why we've invited Steve as well. Um, so in the initial, sta uh, initial stages of Steve's uh, research, he came up to the College and met with the academic staff just to share some of the, uh, the figures that he was discovering in his research, research and, uh, and some of the, 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 the tentative findings that he was drawing from, uh, from that research back in the early days um, when Steve was working towards his demon, demon? Yes. Yes. Demon, a doctor of ministry uh, degree. Okay, let me, ask, let me ask you a few questions, Steve, before we uh, open it up to the floor. So, Three words. In three words, why why should anyone read this book? <laughs> um, That's a word. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to speak. That's it. All my words. Um, I, actually, there were three words mm. that were in my mind as I set out to write this book, um, and they're were three words which I passed on to a small group of people I got to read the draft chapters of this book. And I said, these three words are what I'm trying to do, and I'd like you to help me in, in that process. And the three words were, firstly, um, that it would be reliable. And, and what I mean by that is that it would be rooted in, in sound evidence. So it wouldn't just be my bright ideas or anybody else's, but it would actually be built from the, from the research that we've done and would be faithful to what we've actually discovered through that. So reliable was the first one. The second one was readable. Now, I've already been picked up on my grammar here uh, this <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> but I, I'd already written a thesis uh, based on some of this research. I, I'd written an academic paper, for a journal and things, but nobody reads those things, of course. And 
I, I was really stimulated by what I discovered from the research and I wanted other people to read it and to engage with it. So, so I wanted to write it in a style that, that was uh, accessible and, and, and easy to read. Um, and the third one was that it would be practical. And each chapter in the book actually finishes with a section which is subtitled, So What? And within that section there are sometimes some questions or sometimes some activities to help people to apply what they've just read in their own situation, whatever that might be. So those will be my three words that I aspire to at least. Very good. And uh, you can all tell me mm -hmm. some future time whether I manage that or not. So good words, reliable, readable, practical, excellent. You've mentioned that a little bit, and I guess I've alluded to it as well. Tell us a little bit about the backstory. How did the how did the book come about? What you know, the origins of the idea and the the, the development, the publication. Yeah. So, I was part of a vibrant local <laughs> congregation in the village where I lived, down in in Speyside, in the late eighties, early nineties, and I then went away. Uh, my wife and I went and worked overseas for 12 years and then kind of unexpectedly we came back to the same village. We hadn't planned to do that from the beginning but you know, 12 years almost to the day that we left we ended back up in the same village, part of the same church. And when we rejoined that church we found it was, a, it was in good heart, it was a healthy congregation. But because we'd known the church so well in the past, we did find ourselves kind of looking around the, the faces there and thinking, gosh, where's so-and-so? And, and we just started to notice a number of people who had been very involved in the congregation 12 years earlier and now were um, noticeable to us by their absence. And then we started to meet many of those people. So I think to start with, I thought they'd maybe moved away, but you know, meet people in the shop or at the bus stop or walking a dog or whatever and in our conversation with those people it became clear that in most cases their Christian faith was still very important to them but for a whole variety of reasons they were no longer engaged with this congregation and I think to start with I thought it was to do with this congregation um, they had been through a bit of a hard time while we'd been uh, away actually but then I started my current job and started working with other congregations around the, the region and began to realize that actually not only was this not unusual, this was kind of the norm. And that perhaps I'd been almost privileged in a sense to go away for 12 years and come back to the same situation. You kind of see things uh, in sharp relief uh, in that kind of situation. Um, so, yeah, I found myself really challenged by that, and it started me reading and thinking, and, mm -hmm. and that was the, that's the backstory, I guess, that eventually led to me undertaking the, the research behind this book. Interesting. And at first stage, it was part of uh, an academic project? Yeah, it was, although I wanted to do the research, and I joined an academic institution to supervise it because I wanted to do it well and I needed that supervision and expertise, so uh, the research came, sure. the idea so of the research of the came first, I, I, I wasn't doing it to get qualification in particular. Sure. Mm -hmm. sure. okay. And what was the qualification, just for completeness? Uh, doctor of Ministry. With? <laughs> which institution? Uh, with uh, <laughs> Glyndor University in Wales, um, which is, there's something called the Centre for Studies in Rural Ministry, um, which is linked to that university and people from, you know, quite a few people from Scotland actually, people from around the UK who have a particular interest in rural church um, are, are linked into that particular mm -hmm. university. So a lot of research over a number of years, it, was there anything that particularly surprised you in your findings Steve? Yes, there, there, there certainly was. Um, too much to to share uh, in answer to that question but uh, I would say there have been three distinct parts to the research and I think each had its particular surprises so the first part was um, I interviewed a sample of people who 
were Christians but not attending church. And within that sample, we had uh, people of different generations, uh, men and women living in different parts of, of this region, the north of Scotland, with a variety of experiences of, of church. And I think what surprised me in that phase of the research was, uh, and I, I feel almost ashamed to, to say this in a mm -hmm. sense, but it, it undid some of my own prejudices and stereotypes in that some of the people I met during those interviews were some of the most impressive Christian people I've ever met. Um, they were, they tended to be people of deep commitment to their faith, and I met a number of people of quite outstanding uh, courage and, and creativity, and and I found that quite quite challenging. Uh, the second part of the research was was this big survey of, of of a large random sample, and I guess the thing that surprised me from that was the scale the scope of this phenomenon that uh, you know we phoned five and a half thousand people at random around the highlands and islands you know those those cold calls you get that are really annoying <laughs> well the amazing thing was that half the people we phoned were willing to have a short conversation with us um, so the, the opening line mentioned uh, the church of scotland and this university and I, so i think if people felt they had something to say, maybe they, they stuck with it. But anyway, of those people who identified themselves, sorry, I'll start again. Those people who were willing to have a conversation, 44% said, I'm a Christian, but I don't attend a local church. And as I've already said, half of those people then went on to demonstrate through the survey that they were uh, you know, a high degree of commitment. So, yeah, it's a, it's a big deal. Um, yeah. And I think I'd already realized in my own village that I could identify more people who I knew were Christians but not attending church than were in the congregation on a Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. So that was the second thing. The third bit of the research was we took it to the rest of Scotland uh, through a telephone survey this time. And what surprised me with that was I expected to find quite a difference between rural and urban areas, and I didn't. It was remarkably similar across the board. I think I thought that um, if you live in an urban area, there's a great diversity of, of church options available to, to people, and therefore there would be a much lower proportion of people who are, who are disengaging from church. That wasn't really the case. It was pretty similar across the country, actually. So that's three surprises. But, uh, that's interesting. Yeah, actually, that's one of my questions. One of my questions was, would you expect to see a difference between a rural setting and an urban setting? But it's, it is a, a fascinating fact that you don't. Yeah. It's the kind of book that our students would love. Because it's got cartoons. <laughs> 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 and it, uh, why, why the cartoons, Steve? That's an interesting choice. Yeah. Well, I, I guess it comes back to the second word, readable. Um, Here's a controversial sound bite for you. Uh, oh, it's on, on film as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, most research is a waste of time. Um, and the reason I say that is because most research never gets read. Never goes anywhere. It doesn't actually find an audience who are uh, stimulated by it. It doesn't make a difference. And so that's why I wanted to write a book that was readable and, and that's why I wanted these cartoons in it and uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the, the cartoonist his name is Dave Walker uh, he has a, a regular slot in the church times and also in a cycling magazine but I'd come across his cartoons and and I, I loved them because when you've stopped laughing you then go uh, they're bit like Jesus' parables in some way. They, they kind of, they, they've got an edge to them. And I thought, gosh, if I could cooperate with this cartoonist in such a way that he can take some of these ideas and present them in a visual way, that would be great. And I think he's done that. Um, so I've actually never met Dave, but we talked a lot on the phone and i um, meeting him later this year, but I'm really pleased with, with what he's done. Excellent. Yeah, stop provoking stuff. 
What, what, what are your hopes for the book? What, what impact do you hope it will have? I, th I think I've written it for three audiences. Everything's three. <laughs> you started. <laughs> uh, firstly, I hope that uh, among those uh, many, many people who are Christians and not part of church in the traditional sense, I hope that many of those people will read the book and feel um, feel I've done them right, feel understood, and. I hope that some will read it and find within it some ideas or some vocabulary that helps them in terms of understanding their own journey. Um, because I think in some of the conversations I've had around the book, that has sometimes been the case. People have said, this, this is me. Um, so I hope it's helpful in that way. second group of people I've written it for are those who are uh, a part of a local congregation and a concern for, for the, the health of, of the congregation. And you know, the subtitle to the book is um, Learning from the Experiences of Churchless Christians. So I guess my hope is that, that those people will, will hear and, uh, and learn some helpful things. Uh, and the third group is people who may have no personal interest in faith whatsoever, but who are interested in changes in society. Because there are a lot of um, sociologists and uh, historians and other academics who looked at the statistics of church attendance mm -hmm. and concluded that Scotland and the Western world generally is on a, a very steep, uh, irrevocable slide into secularization. And I think they've got it wrong. Um, I don't think that's the case. There is an overall um, uh, decline of religious faith in the UK, for example, but it, it's quite small. It's nothing like what is indicated by the change in church attendance. Um, so I hope some of those people will get past the cartoons and actually <laughs> see that there's, there's some, some data underneath this book which challenges some of their conclusions, because in a sense I've, I've tried to look behind the statistics, whereas I, I feel they've taken the statistics and made a huge assumption that leaving church means leaving faith, and clearly that is, is not the case for most people. Hmm. Interesting, very interesting. Do you want to do a reading now or after questions? After questions. After, after questions. questions. Right, folks, uh, I have several more questions, but uh, I think it's high time that... Uh, uh, we open up uh, the question to the floor. Uh, I'm sure you all have questions. Can I put a blanket ban on HTC staff for the time being <laughs> uh, until uh, until we exhaust the questions from the floor, and uh, and then we'll maybe uh, open it up to them. Okay. Any questions for Steve? Please. I, I warned if I had a question. <laughs> I got, me what it was, then. I got the book a month ago and <laughs> it covered, covered and I was really enjoyed it. I mean, and, and I think what my background is sort of in statistics, and so often I find that uh, when the church does a sort of survey, I cringe and you don't know anything about sort of sampling and that sort of stuff. And it was a delight to see the rigour of your um, study, and, and I, I really was very, very impressed. Being very personal, there's only one thing I, I, I was having difficulty coming to, to grips with in my personal life. <laughs> um, I, the past four years, I've been ministering in the Scottish Episcopal Church. And I could completely relate to what you've written, and I could sort of see people in, you know, who perhaps seem to be drifting away or whatever. Um, and, and it all made perfect sense to me. I could really think of individuals. I think you'd represented them well. But the first 15 years of my ordained life, I was in the Roman Catholic Church. And I just couldn't sort of see that here. It seemed a completely different experience. Someone actually said to me, what's the biggest difference having moved from Roman Catholic Church into a Reformed Church? I'd say it's the idea of the church. Um, someone in my own denomination, I'm sure, could feel that they were very much 
committed to Jesus Christ uh, without regularly attending church. The Roman Catholic setting, you probably feel that, you know. Uh, I think most people who are Roman Catholics who drift away from the church are doing something much more dramatic than something on a Reformed church. Mm -hmm. I think they are, but they're probably more rare, and it's a more dramatic statement. They are made a big decision, and probably in their view, that they may well have given up the faith. So, within Reformed churches, I'm sort of saying, so I see sort of three very clear groups those who go to church, those who have no Christian faith, and then the middle group, uh, the invisible church. And I can clearly see the invisible church. But in my time as a Roman Catholic, I wouldn't have seen this invisible church. It would either have been visible or they'd have given up the faith. I just wondered if you could comment on that. Mm. Because I, I couldn't quite give it out of my mind as I read your books. I'm not being critical. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just saying that, you know, a different experience. Yeah. I mean, in the research, we didn't, we didn't ask people in our surveys about what kind of congregation they've been part of previously. So we weren't, um, we're not in a position to say, um, to differentiate between Roman Catholic, Free Church, Church of Scotland, or, or whatever. What we do know from other research is that the, the patterns within denominations are quite different. So in Scotland, uh, been very rapid decline in, in church attendance, <coughs> church membership over recent decades. Actually, if you take the Church of Scotland out of those figures, it's, it's not too bad. <laughs> um, so the Church of Scotland is by far the, the kind of the biggest slice of, of, of church decline in Scotland. If you look at um, Northern Ireland, it's the Roman Catholic Church, actually, almost similar proportion of the decline is is uh, is there now. I don't have any evidence to suggest why that might be in each situation, and I also don't know whether within Scotland the the relative stability of, of the Roman Catholic Church is because it is relatively stable, or because a lot of people have left but they've been replaced by other people. We, we don't know that. So I suspect that it may be the latter because part of the migration trend of, of recent decades has been a lot of people from countries um, where Roman Catholicism is very strong. And, and so I, I suspect there's some of that going on. Um, but I, I mean, I think you're, the, the main point you're making is about the church, isn't it? You, what is the church? And, and clearly, um, Coming from a Roman Catholic background, people would have a, a, a different perception about that. Among the people we uh, interviewed, because when we interviewed people, we didn't ask them questions. I just asked them, tell me about your life as far as it relates to the Christian faith and any experiences of church. And then I put my recorder on. And some spoke for 10 minutes, and some spoke for two and a half hours. <laughs> and, and then we transcribed those interviews and, and analysed the, the transcripts. And I think I'm right in saying most of the people I interviewed had had a range of... Um, had, had been involved with a range of different denominations. And there were certainly people who had had involvement with the Roman Catholic Church. Um, but yeah, I haven't really answered your question, because I can't. Um, but I think it's a very interesting point. It's, it's a similar point, but uh, coming through my mind, I mean, what do these people do who are not going to church but say they have retained their faith? Presumably they're not giving, they're not joining in Bible study or fellowship. I mean, in terms of discipleship, you know, where is their life going and how can you sustain um, a faith which is growing when you don't communicate you know, in a biblical way with fellow believers. You know, I, I find it kind of difficult. What do they do on a Sunday, for instance? Do they pray or do they go shopping? Or what, what, what are... Okay. Well, and the interesting thing is, or I find it interesting anyway, <laughs> is that one of the first thing, things that people do as they disengage from a congregation they've maybe been involved with for many years is look for Christian fellowship. 
So the majority of people I have interviewed and surveyed are, are not isolated. Um, they find fellowship in other ways, often at small informal ways that may be as simple as, uh, as meeting with a, a friend, a couple of friends, over a cup of coffee. Some find themselves at the nucleus of a new kind of church, uh, which may look very different to uh, the congregation they've been part of in the past. Some of those people, uh, for some of those people that's been an intentional thing and for others less so. Some people would say that part of their reason for disengaging from church is their hunger for the very things you've described, so for fellowship, for discipleship, um, and people long for uh, a deeper relationship with other believers, a, a, a deeper um, experience of discipleship, and have been looking for that in the congregation and, and not found it. So. So, I mean, if I asked everybody in this room who is part of a local congregation to come up with a few words to express what it is that they find is great about being part of a local congregation, they would come up with many of the same things that I've heard from people who have disengaged from congregations. So, um, so, so is the problem really in the way the traditional churches are organized and spreading the gospel and being relevant to people in in sort of more modern society you know are they stuck in the past and these people just don't find that's the kind of environment they can thrive in um i think you, you said two or three things that are all important i think you know, one is yes society has changed very yeah. radically in in recent years and in many cases, local congregations haven't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and in saying that, I don't mean to imply that congregations should, should change in line with every kind of fad and fashion. I, I don't mean that at all. But it does mean that because society is changing quickly, if congregations are to remain relevant and engaged, let's say, that they need to change too. Um, now, sorry, you, there was a second part. Uh, no, I, I, really you, you, I think you've answered it. Uh, it, it sorry, it really I've lost is, it. Yeah, there was it, another, it is about the sort of modern aspect to it. Yeah. approach, if you like, to communication, mm. to worship even, and songs, and mm. so forth. Yeah. I know what I was going to... Yeah, your second part was, it's a pro, you, know, you described it as a problem. It's the problem, this. And I think my conclusion... Uh, actually, I want you to buy the book, so I'm <laughs> <laughs> reluctant to spoil yeah. alert. I think that the big pattern we see is not one of decline, it's one of change and transition. And I think if we talk about the church with a big C, so the, the Christian community, we see that, that people are doing fellowship and discipleship and mission and worship in different ways to the past. And I think some of the people um, who we've been interviewing and surveying are probably the avant-garde for what is coming. Uh, some of the ways they are experiencing church uh, is perhaps a glimpse of how church may be more in the future. Uh, interesting, very fascinating parallels with our own background, which has been mainly in the Arab world over the last uh, 30 odd years, uh, and seeing what is happening now in the Middle East where the traditional historic churches have been your veritable lumps of salt, very visible, and therefore attracting the, the hostility of the Islamist movements, whereas unseen and under the radar much more are the churches developing and growing out of Islam and who are unknown yet well known uh, in Paul's words mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and um, wondering if, if there's something similar happening for the future here where the church will be more unknown uh, and yet well known rather mm -hmm. than visible I mean salt was meant to disappear into the surrounding food uh, and, uh, and affect the food that it was uh, in rather than remaining as, as lumps of salt, as it were. 
Yeah, no, I, th I think you're right. Uh, my book is very much about the Western world. Um, and as well as my own research, I, I quote other research from Australia, New Zealand, uh, USA, England and Wales. But uh, just in reading I've done the last few days, actually, I, I, I think you're right. You know, other parts of the world we, we see changes in the church, uh, very significant changes in the church, perhaps stimulated by other things, um, as, as you've said. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. I actually know this because it was before, um, and I think if I go for it, one of the reasons you say that people are coming out is because they found the church toxic. So, am I right? Did you say that? Um, I, I think just wondered if that's right, could you explain that a little bit more? What do you mean by that? Yeah. Um, Sorry, uh, yeah, yeah. Question. Uh, I think the, the point that Anne was making was that in the book, Steve Summer wrote that some of those who describe themselves as churches as Christians said that they found the church to be toxic. Mm. And Anne was asking one for verification and two for explanation. Uh, I mean, I think the first thing to say is that <coughs> one of the things that surprised me is that most of the people I have interviewed who were part of churches and now aren't speak very warmly of the church, actually. Um, having said that, uh, there are people who, for whom church has become um, yet yeah, really difficult. And, and people, in describing the, the process, uh, and as I say, often over a period of months of, of disengaging from church, describe real anguish and, and you know, sleeplessness and depression and a real... Um, battle going on within them. So, you know, people don't, uh, on the whole, leave church for trivial reasons. Um, and that's important to say because in the past, that has been said. <laughs> uh, that, that, is, that is a very unusual situation. Now, coming back to the word toxic, um, the fascinating thing is, I think, that you can have a congregation which for some people is really helpful. It's a real source of blessing to those people. And for and the same congregation for some people can become really unhelpful. Um, now toxic, I think the word toxic is kind of an extreme end of that. Now I think there are churches that for all kinds of reasons become toxic. Uh, I think that's very unusual. Um, I mean I'm you know, I work with lots of different congregations. I'm pretty convinced that by far the majority of congregations genuinely want to be welcoming and inclusive and, and hospitable. Um, so the main thing that comes out of the research isn't about toxic churches, actually. It's more about um, ordinary churches which become unhelpful for some people. Um, so, yeah. Have you picked up from your research, how, or have people said anything about how the churches, congregations reacted when they were going through the process? I mean, certainly I've, I've heard in the past, you know, people quoted as saying, I left the church and nobody even noticed, or nobody came and visited, nobody asked me what was going on. Um, is that something that people, from your research is fairly common or is that an exception? No, that is very common. Uh, in my research that comes across as common and in other research, other parts of the world, that comes across too. And I think one of the things I've tried to explore in the book actually is, is to explain why that might be. And uh, what I suggest there is that there is a process that you could describe as, as mutual retreat so it's not just about a congregation and a person disengaging. It's a bit more complicated than that, the dynamics of it. So, for example, if a person begins to diminish their commitment a bit, it would not be unusual for, uh, for those in leadership or for those kind of in the core of the church, if you like, to, to react to them slightly differently, probably not consciously. But I think what we see over a period of time is, is a gradual uh, drifting apart. Mm -hmm. 
which sometimes then ends with a, a final straw. And I think one of the reasons people have sometimes said, oh, people leave for trivial reasons, is because they see the final straw. And they may be unaware of the, the months or years of, of anguish and soul searching that has gone on before them. Um, so there's a chapter in the book which talks about you know, the journey. I mean, everybody's journey is unique, obviously. But as we look at hundreds of people we've, we've interviewed and surveyed, we can see certain common, kind of well-worn trails, if you like. And, and I've tried to, to express that in, in the book a bit. Thank you. Is another head over here? Yeah, well, a couple of questions. Could I ask you um, to cast your mind forward, say, 20 years um, in, in the north, and how you might describe the church seen or unseen? Uh, so what does it, does it look like? Um, it's a sort of impact on society, greater or less. Um, and secondly, does that do, do you draw optimism uh, from that, or do you find it a pessimistic prospect? Mm. There you go. Remembering that the Deuteronomic penalty for false prophecy is stolen. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure, Steve. <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll answer the second bit first. I, uh, I, I feel hopeful for um, for the church. Um, I think the book. Is a, is a hopeful book, actually. And it's hopeful because I, I do believe we'll look back in some decades' time and see that this wasn't a time primarily of decline, but, but of change, of, of transition. And I think the, the best indicator, perhaps, we have of that is by looking at some other parts of the world. I mean, we don't have to look far, actually. If you look... If you look at England and Wales, or England particularly, the change in church involvement in England has pretty much levelled out. So after a period of quite steep decline, it, it's kind of bottomed out. And the reason it's bottomed out is because whilst many traditional churches continue to decline, there are some significant areas of growth. And the areas of growth are in things like uh, fresh expressions, so you know, new kinds of church that perhaps wouldn't have been recognised as church in in the past. Now, Scotland's a bit of a late starter on that kind of process. So, the Church of Scotland joined the Fresh Expressions movement last year, I think, or the year before. But you know, it's still very early days. But even in the last year or two, we can see quite a mushrooming of, of that. And I think some of the people who have left traditional congregations um, are our pioneers, actually. So we're, just, we're coming to a time now where mainstream denominations are looking around and saying, we want to appoint pioneers. Well, many of them have left the building, actually. Mm -hmm. and, and some of them have, have got on with it. Mm -hmm. And they may not have discovered the term fresh expressions or emerging church or anything else yet, but they're just doing it anyway. Uh, so I think we, we just see tiny glimpses of that yet, but I think yeah, 20 years down the road we'll see a lot more of that, just as we do, we're now 10 years down the road in England with Fresh Expressions, and there are hundreds of Fresh Expressions around the UK. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Yeah. You mentioned that several, quite a lot of the folk you interviewed were meeting with other Christians, which is good. But what about those who have chosen not to meet up with other Christians? You know, we're told not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. So I can't quite get my head around Christians, and I'm talking about born again people leaving a church, mm -hmm. but yet not having no desire to meet up yeah. with other believers. Well, I think that's two. There's two different things there. One is not having a desire, and the other is it not happening. Um, I, I haven't met anybody who's got no desire to to meet up with others. Uh, I have met people who have yet to find uh, what is for them a helpful way of doing that. Um, I, for example, one person comes to mind who was part of this research, who's a very committed Christian, but for reasons of their own mental health, find the congregational type setup, or actually any kind of significant group of people, really difficult. Just can't do it. Now, that person, to some extent, has fellowship over the internet. Um, so they're, they're not 
kind of totally disengaged from a Christian community. And you may think, well, that's an extreme example, but actually, uh, if you look at the statistics for, for mental health in, in Scotland, you know, there, there are many people for whom that would be difficult. Um, yeah, so, uh, 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 as I say, I haven't met anybody who said, I don't want to meet up with anybody else. That's not the story. There are people who find that difficult, but that's another thing. I mean, the other thing that's maybe worth saying is that, you know, that you, you quoted a scripture there, and I think we all know in the New Testament there are many of the uh, one another statements. You know, we are told to love one another, to uh, to bear one another's burdens, etc. And the passage you quoted, which is about uh, meeting together, is is also one of those one another statements. If you look at it, in fact, there are two two one another statements part of that um, bit that you quoted. And many of the people who have left church haven't done so because they don't want to meet with others, but partly out of frustration about those one and other things. Um, you know, that scripture is not just about the physical process of being in the same place with other people, it's about, it's about the quality of what happens when, when we are together as believers. Um, and I think, yeah, as I say, m many people have left searching for that, l longing to, to be better at one anothering one another, um, <laughs> if that makes sense. Putting on my statistical hat again, um, oh, no. I sometimes wonder if there's a sort of critical mass, a critical number of people, but one, one, one sort of needs for an active church, visible church community. Because I think we want a situation where sometimes we might go on holiday somewhere or, you know, and, and find a, a church which is very similar to the one we're at. Um, and, um, you know, find that for some reason it seems to be very lively and very well attended and very well supported and we sort of think well you know if we're marking out a tender building the standard of preaching quality of coffee after the service all sorts of things it would actually be quite similar to our church but <coughs> our church seems to be you know dwindling when you know people are drifting away and that leads me to wonder whether a way forward is unity i didn't mean unity between the denominations which you know must, must be our our great prayer, but but actually sometimes within a town for a couple of churches, perhaps a denomination, to come together and form, um, you know, rather than two separate parishes, have one. Because I think we all know what sometimes it's like to actually worship in, you know, with a, 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 a quite a large group of people. It can be very uplifting. Not just things like the hymn singing is better, but you know, we do feel really part of community. And I could see that. If numbers fall too low, you do just drift away because you don't see the benefits of being part of that larger worshiping community. So I wonder if the way ahead is a bit more coming together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not based on my research, but the, the previous <coughs> Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, said he sees the future of the church as being characterized by the small and the big the cell and the celebration, the, the small group and the festival. And I do think it's a challenge that in, in the Highlands and Islands particularly, our congregations often fall between the two. They're not, they're not big enough to have that, that sense of, of, of celebration and, and corporate life. Um, and yet they're not small enough to be um, that kind of intimacy and that accountability that you might get in the kind of uh, a home group type situation. So I think that is a challenge. I mean, generally speaking, small churches find it easier to grow than, than big churches. You know, I, I think you put your finger on something really important there, and there, there is lots of research out there, not mine, but other people's about um, different sizes of church and the, and the particular challenges that face them. This may well be answered in your book, but uh, I just wondered if you found during your research that people were put off in any way by the form of the traditional church service. 
which for many years has probably been you know, three 19th century hymns followed by a 30 minute sermon on an obscure verse in Numbers or something like that. And people said, well, I would love to go to church, but I just do not connect with what happens in there for an hour and a half on Sunday. To some extent, it, it, it wasn't unusual <coughs> within the research for people to say that they found church boring or they found church irrelevant, and by irrelevant I mean didn't kind of fit with the rest of their life. But interestingly, when we asked in the Scotland-wide survey about could you imagine yourself re-engaging <coughs> with a church congregation, first thing to say is two-thirds said uh, no. All right, So two-thirds of you have no intention of re-engaging with a congregation as they've known it. But if we look at the third, who were actually quite open to that, um, only a third of that third, uh, <laughs> we have a statistician in the room who can help us, only a third of that third said it was about the style, if you like. So if there was a, a style of church that was different to what they'd experienced before, they might be open to that. Uh, the larger part of that group said, uh, I could imagine that re-engaging with the congregation, if it fitted with the rest of life. It was more to do with, with accessibility. So it might be when and where it meets, for example. So overall, within the research, we can say that there's only a small number of people for whom the style or theology are the big thing. Uh, now, it may be a part of the the whole package for, for lots of people, but it's a very small number of people for whom that is the main issue, um, which surprised me. Okay, let me open it up to staff now. <laughs> 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 Any questions? No? I think now they realise all the answers are in the book. <laughs> I, um, thank you very much, Steve. It's been very interesting, um, and uh, I think a lot to, to think about, not least about that image that will stick with me of um, a leaving process perhaps going on for months or years uh, before it actually happens. I guess part of what's going on in my thinking is that there will always have been folks who may not be able to be part of a fellowship, for instance. Um, a gathering, so many congregations would have housebound people, for instance, who, uh, who are clearly, evidently, uh, living a Christian life, but for whatever reason are prevented from, um, from being part of it. So I wonder whether the folks that you're thinking of are different from those, or would include some of those. Um, and, and also just whether, and I think perhaps your last comment has partly answered this, whether there was any sense that something wasn't right in their circumstances or were they entirely comfortable in their circumstances and I, I think you've hinted at that already um, that, that some long for meeting some perhaps don't but those were the two things that struck me the the, the, the original housebound the, or, or, uh, the existing situation that churches are well aware of but where there is some sense of connection to a wider congregation mm -hmm. and then that issue of how comfortable are people with it. Yeah. Um, well, the, the first one, uh, I think some of those people who are uh, the housebound would have uh, opted into our surveys because the way we uh, defined regular church attendance um, would mean they were in a slightly <coughs> grey area, perhaps. I mean, we, we describe regular attendance as more than six times a year excluding Easter, Christmas, marriages, and um, funerals, etc. Now, you may think, I suspect those who are chuckling are thinking, yeah, that's setting the bar quite low. The, the, the reason we did that is because that was a figure that's been used in similar research in other parts of the world, and I wanted to be able to draw comparisons. And I figure if, if people are attending less than that, then they, they're definitely fitting our definition of not engage with a, a congregation. 
uh, in terms of what is a local church, we said it's a, it's, um, it's a group that gathers regularly for worship together and is engaged with some kind of wider network. So that might be a, a traditional denomination, it might be some other network. Um, so, yeah, some of your house band would, would opt into that. And then, you, you, sorry, your second part was about... Uh, was there a sense that something wasn't quite ideal about the situation, yeah. or were the folks largely thinking, this is, this is what I've been searching for all this, yeah. this is where I want to be? Yeah. I think uh, uh, certainly there is, uh, there is guilt, a sense of guilt, and uh, for some people... That is before disengagement, and for some that's after. I think there's kind of a zone there, if you like, mm -hmm. um, stretching from when they're still involved to some time afterwards, where wrestling with what's happening here, what's happening to me, and uh, and what's um, what what am I doing here? Um, but the general picture is that people come to a place where they feel um, better. In a sense. Now, for some people, that happens quite quickly. So, one person quoted in the book said, "Yeah, it was like getting an eighth day to the week." <laughs> um, uh, and for others, that takes some time, um, mm. and that's partly to do with some people before they disengage it are already very active, actively exploring other options, uh, mm. and for others, that doesn't really start until they've already disengaged from the congregation. So. Um, kind of statistical question, I don't know if I could answer it or not, but we just had a church census going on across the whole church in May, which figures are going to show something helpful, but it's not, obviously not going to include the people you're talking about here. Um, the first part of this question is, would the people who have disengaged, would they still consider themselves part of the church worldwide? That's the first one. And if they do, what percentage of the population of say, Scotland as a whole you say you could count as being the church in, in the whole sense? You get, you get what I'm asking? Yes, I, I do. I, if if we're not secular, as you're saying, we're not as secular as people make out. It would be interesting to know that if there was a statistic to express mm -hmm. that. So the fir first question is, is definitely yes. Mm -hmm. By far the majority of people who identify themselves as Christian but not attending a local congregation <laughs> Do I do see themselves as part of the church with a big C, as in the worldwide Christian community? Um, I'm hesitant to try and answer the, the second one, mainly because I don't know what the survey you've just uh, mentioned is going to come up with. Uh, I've got a pretty good idea of of the kind of churchless part of it, but I have less idea about what's going to come out because it's been a long time. It's 2002 was the last Scotland-wide church census. Um, that was a very long time. Mm. And, yeah, if you, if you look at what the trajectory was in 2002, um, I, I would expect the church that has been surveyed at the moment, that meets weekly in bu church buildings, etc., will be much smaller than it was in 2002. What, what is the figure that you would know for, for, that you said you saw? <coughs> Uh, roughly, 22% um, would be. Well, that's one of these curls, is it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it's not actually. That's a different 22%. <laughs> Very confusing. Yeah. So ju just over 20% of people would indicate that they have a, a faith that that is important to them and makes a difference to their lives. So you could yeah. add that on to whatever the church census comes yeah. up with. Which would be that is the realistic yeah. of yeah. where people feel yeah. they stand. Yeah. Now, of course, some people will, will look at that and say, yeah, but what do these people actually believe? Uh, are these orthodox believers? Um, and those ten questions that we asked were not those kind of questions. So what these people indicated was that they have a faith, which they call a Christian faith, which is important to them and makes a difference. But I would say the same thing about congregations too, you know, uh, and, and that evidence is out there, that research has been done, you know, what people actually believe who are part of a congregation on a Sunday morning, you know, it varies hugely too. In the width of your research, have you found that 
a, a significant number of people who regard the church as judgmental or divisive and uh, are, are recoil from that uh, understanding of the church. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you put a percentage on that? No, and, no. and actually it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a huge percentage no. that, uh, of, of people who've, who've used those, those words, mm -hmm. but certainly those words and those ideas are part of the, part of the mix. Yeah. Bruce, can you say how new or how old the invisible church is? Is it something that extends some way in, into the historic past? Uh, and is it in a, a period of growth at this time? I don't think I can say that with any certainty. I know that some of the people I've encountered while doing this research have been disengaged from church for many years. Uh, so for them individually, it's not a new thing. But I, you know, the research is a snapshot, and we don't have an earlier snapshot. And um, yeah, so it's hard to say. Can we have a hand over here? Yeah. Yes, please. Is it me? Yes, it is you. Sorry. Some years ago, a book was written called Outside Verdict about the organisation of the Church of Scotland. Uh, basically, in a sentence, it said. The church is a hopeless organisation run by some very good people. Uh, it seems to me that since then, the church, and particularly if you think of something like the General Assembly, simply has not been prepared to face that criticism. It's a hopeless organisation. You would never invent it if you were starting now. Really, to run any organisation, it's ridiculous. Is that really, that's bound to influence the situation all the way through. And it's not surprising to me, bearing that in mind, that what people appear to be doing is to look for some totally different way of expressing what they believe. Would you like to comment? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I want to try and stick about what I actually know through this research rather than comment more generally about that thing. And that is that this is a phenomenon which is not just about any particular denomination or denominations. It's, it's generally about a move from expressing faith in quite an institutional way to living faith in a, in a more organic and, and more intensively relational way I would say that's the kind of pattern um, now you know you've mentioned one denomination which is is highly institutional in the way it's it's structured and organized uh, having said that uh, within any particular denomination there's a real range of local expression so within the Church of Scotland yes you know when you look at the whole organization and as Harry Reid did in that book um, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's lacking in, in many areas. And yet, you know, local congregations can be fantastic. Um, it's in spite of, not because of. Yeah, yeah, and you could say the same with other denominations too, yeah. Okay, Martin, last question. Hey, Steve, I get the impression from what you've said that some of these people you're referring to are quite self-contained <coughs> perhaps feel they've arrived at where they want to be, but would you say that there are maybe many out there who are not being ministered to, who feel isolated, who could benefit from some form of pastoring, mentoring, exhorting, teaching from some external group or individuals? You know, do you see a role for some sort of um, mentoring? Be um, well, f first of all, to go back to your your um, your starting point there, I, I don't think these are gen. It would be wrong to say these are people who feel they've got to where they want to be. Um, I think you know what I've heard over these last years is uh, people on a journey, and I think we all recognise that. You know, our, our faith life is a journey. You know, that can be a bit of a cliche, but but you know certainly my faith is not exactly the same as it was 20 years ago. Um, and part of the difficulty is people are on a, on a journey and sometimes that leads to this growing apart.
from the congregation and, and sometimes it may be a kind of growing together with the congregation. The second part of what you're saying about you know, mentoring and feeding and all that, yeah, I mean, I think these people are, as well as any, any one of us are aware of their need to, to find sustenance for the journey, let's say. And one of the things we discovered through the research was the, the wide variety of ways people find that or search for that. Um, it may be on a kind of face-to-face -face relational level, it can be more online, it can be uh, in, uh, through festivals and through reading and all, all kinds of ways. I mean, we did ask people in the survey, how, how do you nurture your faith? Um, and you can find that, that data there. Um. Okay, Steve, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I think we've had a fair crack of a whip. Um, you go through the section of your book for okay. us just before yeah. we close, and then I'm going to pray for you. Thank you. And then please feel free to stay on and join us for tea and coffee. And have a chat. So, um, the bit I'm going to read is from a chapter entitled Our Never Changing God and His Ever Changing Church. And it just explores the whole area of, of change in the church. And this particular section is, is subtitled, A Kodak Moment? Question mark. One of the best documented business blunders of all time relates to Kodak. Despite having invented the first digital camera, they chose not to develop digital photography. They believed that it threatened their existing business. As other companies went ahead and pioneered the technology that would change forever the way most people take photographs, one of the world's most valuable brands plunged towards bankruptcy. In their blinkered, nearsighted view, decision makers at Kodak misunderstood the ultimate reason for the company's existence and success. They believed they were in the photographic film industry rather than in the business of capturing images and telling stories. I wonder if those of us involved with church congregations sometimes lose sight of the purpose of church, <clears throat> become ambiguous about the nature of our core business. Do we also suffer from a kind of vision-impairing condition and fail to see why congregations or any church-related institutions actually exist? Have we come to believe that we need, I have come to believe that we need to be reminded that church is not the main thing. I suspect that we often make church too important and consequently become too precious about church stuff. Before you start throwing bottles, let me read on. From the many accounts of church leavers, it seems that a fundamental misunderstanding of what church is and isn't is at the root of much misdirected energy and unnecessary angst. The purpose of church is not to perpetuate or grow the church. The raison d'etre of the church is not the preservation of religious traditions. As followers of Jesus, it's all about him and his kingdom. Once again, we need to hear that reminder to keep your focus on Jesus. Jesus himself is the nucleus of the church, the source of its life and its reason for being. His kingdom is our goal, our end and aim. I'm not been pedantic. This is not theological hair splitting. It's impossible to exaggerate the importance of the kingdom in the teaching of Jesus. In the Sermon on the Mount, it is the kingdom that we are told to seek first, to prioritise above all else. As Jesus travelled from village to village, he proclaimed the kingdom by his words and demonstrated it through his actions. In sending out his followers, he instructed them to do likewise. The word mission literally means sent, and so we read in the Gospels that the followers of Christ are co-missioned, that is, sent together to work towards the establishment of God's kingdom. 
Although Jesus never gave a neat definition of the kingdom, his meaning is clear in the first request of what we often call the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom is not some obscure esoteric religious concept. In everyday English, a kingdom denotes the territory over which a king reigns. Similarly, in the New Testament, the kingdom refers to the realm over which the king of kings exercises his royal authority. All that is submitted to Christ, in line with his will, under his rule and dominion, is part of his kingdom. As such, we read that the kingdom is here already, in part, but also still to come in its fullness. As Christians, after our devotion to God himself, the kingdom is to be our highest concern. The misunderstandings of, of what church is and isn't stems at least in part from a distorted concept of how it relates to the kingdom. They're not synonymous. The church is intended to be an agent of the kingdom, just as we are all invited to be accomplices in God's purposes. However, church is not one and the same as the kingdom. Some aspects of some church congregations display the characteristics of the kingdom, and others do not. In addition, there is much which is beyond the orbit of church that pleases God, aspects of people's lives and wider society where we can discern the kingdom of God. The fact that Christianity sometimes becomes church-centred and church-focused, rather than Jesus-centred and kingdom-focused, is a tragic reality. Churches, like other organisations, have a propensity to drift. There is a tendency for the most important thing to be eclipsed by more peripheral matters. Non-essential issues seem easily to take centre stage. The catalogue of a Christian resources supply recently dropped through my letterbox. In large letters, the cover proclaimed, Christian Essentials, Below that bold announcement were pictures of candles, church furniture, <laughs> clerical clothing and specialist communion wine. I have no doubt that all these things have a valuable place in certain church traditions. However, they are not, by any stretch of the imagination, Christian essentials. A German proverb obs observes that the main thing is that the main thing remains the main thing. When we fail to abide by that maxim, other things are prone to become substitutes for the main thing. Having been elevated to prominence, these incidentals easily become golden calves, which in time grow into sacred cows. <laughs> Let's pray as we close. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, you are the living God. We thank you for the gift of your Son. And we thank you for the empowering of your Spirit. And we thank you also for the Church. Thank you that you have indeed given us uh, to one another for the upbuilding of your kingdom and for the spread of your gospel. And our prayer, Lord God, is that you would uh, uh, take this book and take Steve's work uh, and that you would use both to equip us in your, your kingdom service to prepare us for the gospel task. And we do pray that this, um, uh, this work would be uh, both a blessing and a challenge to many. And we ask, Lord, that through it, through these words, that we may see more clearly who you are and see where you are at work and become more aware of how we can live our lives in community as fully as possible for your glory and for the praise of your name. So we give this to you, Lord, just as we give ourselves to you. And we pray, Lord, that you will lead us on. In your name we ask this. Amen. Amen. Amen.